Hey everybody, so welcome to this year's Knowledge Graph Technology Showcase, where I go through and give my honest opinions about new cool tools that I have seen out there and give you my honest opinion about what I think about them. These are not sponsored or promotionals or any other thing out there. This is just me honestly reaching out and figuring out what this tool is all about and sharing my insights in case that would be interesting to you. And if you haven't seen one of these before, I'm reaching almost 50 different honest reviews at this point. So if you don't see the tool in the lineup this year, make sure you check out the playlist down below and up above to see if I have reviewed the tool that you are looking for. And today we are going to be reviewing, yeah, that one. And as with all of these videos, my honest opinion is summarized at the very end of this video. All right, so with all of that said, let's go get started. Uh, my name is Brian Platts. I'm the CEO of Flurry. Uh, Flurry is a business I started um, along with my co-founder, Flip Filipowski, about seven years ago. And I have been in enterprise software, starting enterprise software companies my whole career. So about, you know, um, 25, 30 years now. So mm -hmm. yeah, today we are going to give a preview of our new online version or cloud version of mm -hmm. our semantic graph database product. Uh, nice. So it's something we call uh, Flurry V3. Uh, mm -hmm. It's part of our product portfolio. And maybe I'll get a chance to sort of explain the breadth of what we do uh, before mm -hmm. we kind of just hone in on this one specific tool. Mm -hmm. All right, cool. Let's get started. Um, so on the front end of this, obviously, we're dealing with mountains of legacy data. So before we can become the system of record, we have to be able to allow us to seamlessly work with the systems of records. Um, so we kind of have two products that focus on converting legacy data, both structured and then unstructured. And we use a lot of uh, machine learning in that and a, a lot of great technology. We're not gonna go through any of that today, but uh, if you're interested in that, uh, really cool stuff, a lot of uh, training, thumbs up, thumbs down sort of stuff and teaching machines how to take data in any format effectively and transform it into golden records and into the ontologies that you're interested in. Of course, we have technology for managing uh, taxonomies and ontologies. Yeah. We're not really gonna get into that today either. Um, and then what we are gonna get into today is once we have the data in this format, how do we sort of hook this in to a data ecosystem and be able to really leverage this data and get the most value out of it? The back side of this, which is then, you know, how do we enable a Google-like interface to for consumers to find this data or business users to consume this data? We're not going to get much into that today as well. We're just really going to focus on the database side of this. And to the audience, if there is any interest in any of those other things that he was just mentioning that we don't go over in this video. Obviously, I'm sure they have lots of, of things for you to look at, but if you would like an honest review on any of those, leave a comment down below so we can add that to the lineup. Uh, easiest way to describe it, at least for me, is uh, GitHub, but for data. So instead of being a bunch of source code repositories, we're looking at um, a number of data sets. These data sets all run on top of Flurry's open source knowledge graph. So you can run it on your own, of course. You can deploy it anywhere you want. Uh, but this is basically us running it for you, so you don't have to do that. And because we're running this across this, we can do we can create a lot of kind of connective tissue and collaboration features in the background that enable things to be uh, shared. All right. So our knowledge graph has a lot of very special features in it, um, and we'll hit on a couple of those. Uh, one is because our focus is on collaboration, what we need to do is we need to enable data to defend itself. We need to embed actually security and policy into the data tier. Mm -hmm. Then we can build things around it really easily and share it more freely because we know it's protected. Um, likewise, we focus a lot on cryptography. Um, just like when you're browsing the web, you get that little lock icon. In fact, I have one up here right now that says I can trust that this information hasn't been tampered with. It came from who I think it came from. When machines automatically connect to data, they need the same thing. And we do a lot related to that. Um, we also focus a lot on time because if you're collaborating across data sets and even across organizations, you can never get consistent results if every data set is changing all the time. 
So how do you lock in a moment in time? And yeah. we actually think of uh, a database differently. We think of what most people think of as a database. We think of as a ledger. And every mm -hmm. time you update that ledger, it creates a new database. And every single database can never, ever be changed. And they all exist forever. And we do this extremely efficiently, which means that you can That's query. Supporting all of those legacy uh, databases in, in your terminology. So how do you make it efficient? Well, there's a lot of technical details in that. But, you know, every version of a database is really just tiny deltas. I so see. Okay, that makes sense. It requires very little storage overhead. You know, I think the trick becomes making queries very fast across the time <laughs> dimension. And we have a very special way we index data because indexes are what allow us to execute fast queries. We index data in very special ways that allow us to slice across time is as though it doesn't matter. Where any other database, you'd have to install a backup or, you know, maybe there's some 24 hours of history that you could get to, or oftentimes zero history you can go to. Mm -hmm. We have every moment in history always available extremely efficiently with almost no delay between whether you're querying for the current data or data as of a year ago. Really massive data sets are not an issue. And again, a lot of this becomes on or depends on how you index data. Mm -hmm. So we use, you know, I mean, it's pretty technical, but we use very broad uh, B trees to be able to navigate um, data, which means we're only four levels deep in index nodes at uh, really a petabyte scale database. So uh, because of that, usually you're losing performance uh, in query speed as you're hopping down leaves mm -hmm. in a tree in a node. Mm -hmm. And because even if, you know, we're, we're, uh, we can push everything so high, uh, a 50 megabyte database fits in sort of one leaf and, and we don't go down. And we do this a lot because we get a lot into, you know, spreading out data, caching data at the edge, running query servers at the edge. So we have a unique architecture as well in Flurry. That's great. So we have some data sets here. Let's go ahead and create a new one. Uh, and we'll just call this our uh, new data set just because I don't feel original right now. Uh, <laughs> we could associate a, um, a readme and some other things with it. Um, one of the things is we create this data set, uh, we come directly into a notebook and a quick start guide. And this is just kind of to help people get started if, if they um, haven't used it before. But I'm in my data set now. I can, you know, view the data, execute queries, et cetera. We're actually in this notebook section where we create a notebook. Um, and those who have done, you know, Jupyter notebooks or things are probably pretty familiar with the concept. Um, you can uh, create markdown in your notebook, et cetera, that explains things. But here's a series of transactions and queries. And one of the things that I think you and your audience are going to see is that our focus is on JSON, JSON LD in particular, as a way of representing RDF data. And we are so excited about JSON LD because the interested audience, as I mentioned, in moving this is something developers end up using as they build new applications. Yeah. Developers don't usually build databases on RDF, they build them in oh. relational databases or mind. They don't want to touch Sparkle with a 10 foot pole. <laughs> nope. So what we're doing here is we're actually giving them a MongoDB super simple like experience, but we're actually nice. um, enabling the power of a linked graph. So you, you mentioned Mongo and some of these other things. Is there, do you have your own triple store since you're in RDF behind the scenes or um, can you link out and use others if you're already using a triple store? This is our own triple store that we're uh, looking at. And no, we cannot, of course, because it is RDF data, you could mm -hmm. export out the data and import it into sure. something else. But all these features I just talked about, you know, data defending itself, time very travel, specific to you. these are very specific to, to us. So those mm -hmm. are some of the features that we're kind of showing off here. I transacted it a couple of times because I see I'm at least three moments in time in history uh, here, uh, but we have transacted some, very basic data. If you know JSON-LD, uh, you'll know some of these things, uh, but JSON-LD has at type and at ID, mm -hmm. which are special. At type is a synonym for RDF type. So mm -hmm. we're uh, this is your classes. Mm -hmm. um, of course, we're just storing one class in this case. And at ID is the IRI that is being mm -hmm. used. 
all the others are properties and values, properties mm -hmm. and values. And of course, in JSON, we can represent them as nested. So here in this case, uh, Freddy the Yeti, which happens to be our mascot of Flurry, has a number of friends. And these friends are each nodes in the graph. The, these mm -hmm. are all individual subjects and they're just going in as, as nested nodes, just like a, a MongoDB you know, user might transact a document uh, into mm -hmm. the system. And then, of course, we can turn around and we can query for the data. Now, we do support uh, Sparkle, uh, mm -hmm. but we prefer and actually expose some additional features around what we call Flurry QL, which is literally Sparkle, except in mm -hmm. JSON. So if you know Sparkle, this should not be a jump for you whatsoever. Mm -hmm. The great thing is, is that I can execute queries, like here's my where clause, and you'll see my where clause looks identical to the data that I just put in. So I'm just in this case looking for at type, you know, Yeti, um, and then pulling back all the IRIs, the at ID that match it. And then I'm gonna pipe that into a select clause. One of the cool things we have the ability to do is uh, unlike Sparkle where all your select clauses are just spitting out tables, columns, mm -hmm. here we can actually nest and uh, build out graphs. So, you know, these are all the things that match Yeti. Uh, here's the properties that I'm pulling out. I could just do select star and that's gonna pull out all properties uh, for them. Um, and we start seeing some of the nested objects and then I can even do things like, you know, I just wanna crawl the graph at a depth of, uh, you know, three mm -hmm. and go ahead and run that. And then you see all this data starts getting pulled out. And then you think about, okay, this data is pretty easy to use. And this is exactly how apps want data. Mm -hmm. And this is exactly how developers deal with data. They deal with yeah. JSON, but I'm actually using an RDF graph and I almost wouldn't even know it. And of course, as people get more and more sophisticated, they can leverage those additional features that mm -hmm. I think all the people in this community love. Yeah. Um, linked and relational data, semantic inferencing, et cetera. You know, all of those things become available. Uh, time travel queries, which are not normal in this space. You'd be able to kind of query for different moments in time, et cetera. So one of the things, you know, that I wanted to show off here was I hit the wrong button is uh, if we go to our docs, just mm -hmm. to get just a quick example of leveraging this data. And... Uh, here, I'm going to just spin up real quick an entire React application mm -hmm. that is connecting to this cloud platform mm -hmm. and actually pulling in the data that we're just looking at. And this is a simple React app. In fact, if mm -hmm. I go to my React app and, and uh, just look at the query, you'll see the query literally looks identical to the query we we're just going in the UI. Oh, that's great. It's native JSON. There's no special tools related. We can literally just start spinning up apps around this data. You know, I talked about data defending itself. Mm -hmm. so let's do a little bit more. So what I have here is I have a policy and a every database you create in Flurry automatically has a read all policy. And just like, you know, everyone, which people be excited about the policies themselves are defined as data structures. They're RDF data, so you can query your own policies. In fact, you can make policies that govern policies. Um, and this read only policy is always there, but we have um, in this read only policy, and this is again, just creating RDF underneath mm -hmm. that's transacting. This is just a visual editor. We have just view permissions and we're saying it's targeting all nodes. So we have uh, our data in the system, right? We got some Yetis mm -hmm. and some people in the data. Mm -hmm. And what we want to do is we want to make sure that our read-only policy here uh, only can't see everything, that it can only see things of certain classes. So here we are selecting, we can select all nodes or subjects of or specific classes. We're gonna select everything in the Yeti class and we save our policy. And now if we wanna connect this data that can now understand permissions up to a API key, we can actually um, generate a API key. Just for that user that is allowed, right? 
That's right. So you see yep. sort of the roles here is this read all group. So that's going to restrict the permissions. And then we can uh, go ahead and put that API key in. My React app here is uh, restarting. And that is going to trigger the query. And the only nice. thing I see here are Yetis. If I want to now say that, you know, um, this particular uh, policy group, you can, of course, have all kinds of very sophisticated mm -hmm. policies, but you can say, hey, you can see both Yetis and people. Um, mm -hmm. I could get down to a property level here if oh, I want. Oh, good. I was going to um, ask that. Great. Yeah. In fact, we can even use relationships in the data um, to define that as well. For example, I could say you can't see social security numbers unless it's yours or you're an HR rep that's connected to the individual. Mm -hmm. And you can say select star from SSN, and I'm only going to see mine and those people that I have the relationships yeah. and the data with. It's called yeah. uh, this. This is so incredibly security. important at the analytics level. If you're using a graph to do analytics, you definitely want to make sure that the analytics are only being used by the appropriate people who are allowed to see that information. <laughs> and here I just refresh my my mm -hmm. screen, but and now because I allow people to exist, all of a sudden that data exists. Yeah. So we allow this programmability to go into the data tier to not only enforce permissions, but to also yes. enforce things like shape constraints, you know, data quality rules, et cetera. Um, so hopefully we've shown at least a couple unique things. It's really just yeah. the tip of the iceberg. We didn't get into time yeah. travel or so many of these other things. But time um, travel, since I mean you can't just leave it at, oh, there's time travel. Like, what does that mean? <laughs> Well, time travel, you know, we do expose it here a little bit in the user interface so that you can actually browse data and be able to move forward and backwards in time and see how that data looks differently. But every single query you execute, um, so if we jump back to our notebook and just find a query here, uh, like our, our simple where query, every query you execute, you execute against a version in the database. Yeah. Now here we haven't specified a version to execute against, and we assume what you probably want is the most current data. That's recent. Yeah. Uh, we have a lot of different ways of targeting time. So one is that, uh, I don't know if you recall, but when we transacted data initially, we had a T value, which represents time and incremented by one. We can target a version of the database based on T value. We also record the wall clock time that that happened. So I could say, you know, query as of January 1st at, you know, 2.01 a.m. Um, we allow duration queries, query the database as of five minutes and three seconds ago. So um, every single query can basically, uh, every single query always does target a version of the database. It's just if you don't include a version, uh, we assume you want the latest. Well, like, I mean, obviously there's, you know, a lot of databases doing like graphy things. And, and I mean, you're not just a database, you're obviously a lot of other things, but I, I really, truly appreciate the the attention to the security and when you are exchanging data and making sure that the pe right people can see the right things and things aren't falling through the cracks. But the time series, that is so hard to do in a graph. And you all were just like, yeah, we're going to do it. It's going to be like a core feature. <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> like, pay attention here, folks. Like, this, this is not always normal. So that's really cool. I mean... I'm, uh, geez, like, again, I know I already mentioned like some of the supply chain and transactional and IoT, you know, all of that kind of stuff, but like fraud detection or, you know, threat detection and that kind of thing where you almost have to know the second before it happens, right? Like, I mean, obviously you would want to know it even farther uh, ahead, but that's not usually possible. But having like such an attention to time will help you not only find more trends into those things, um, but it's in the data already. <laughs> like, I mean, that's great. I'm, I'm so impressed by that. Yeah, there's, um, you know, some other cool things which we could spend time on as far as how the product is architected. We can <laughs> actually, in fact, in our, in our documentation, we do do it. We can run the entire database inside of a web browser. You don't even need a server to run the database. We wow. can push database and caching to the edge. You can spin mm -hmm. up query servers next to your apps. They're querying in memory. There's just so many neat features that you really had to approach the product from the ground up to do these. These aren't things you can add sort of after the fact, yeah. or certainly not easily, um, mm -hmm. that uh, hopefully we can talk about someday. Yeah. Well, and I know 
when you're getting into this stage, like all the ETL is figured out, the oncology and the graph is already figured out. Um, I would assume that other pieces of what you all have will allow you to customize ETL, um, go in and modify the the graph if necessary uh, for your for a specific use case. Yeah, and in fact, you know, you can not only set up explicit rules for doing that with something like Owl, but um, we actually lean heavily into teaching machines to natively understand yeah. your data. Throw any data you want at it, and we'll mm -hmm. automatically put it into an ontology. Nice.